Hello and welcome to the 19th edition of the India Business Leader Awards Jury Deliberation. I'm Shireen Bhan and it is my pleasure and honor to introduce you to the IBLA Jury for 2023. We've had a very high-powered uh, discussion and jury deliberation that's just ended. You will have to wait a little bit longer to find out who the winners are of the India Business Leader Awards, but we promise to keep the suspense going. I can tell you that it is an outstanding list of achievers that will be recognized at the India Business Business Leader Awards. Without further ado, the IBLA jury for 2023, the chair of IBLA 2023, Manny Masida. Thank you very much for joining us here this evening. Sham Srinivasan, Abhinav Bindra, Zareen Daruwala. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you here with us on the jury. And to my right, Rohit Java, Anisha, Mithun Sucheti, Nikhil Kamath, and Sandhya Devanathan of Meta. Thank you to each and every one of you for being here with us this evening. Well, as we usually do at the end of the India Business Leader Awards, jury deliberation. We talk about the road ahead for India. Uh, we have, of course, seen a great degree of resilience. We've come off a very sharp recovery in India. But what we're now talking about the road to resurgence. What will be the mega themes, the bets uh, that these leaders are going to be making? What do they see as the drivers for growth, the growth accelerants? That is what we are going to be discussing and debating here. So, Manny Masida, to you first. Uh, as you speak with domestic CEOs here in India, uh, as you speak to global CEOs, what has worked for India in a post-COVID, in a post-pandemic era? And more importantly, what do you see as the big themes driving growth going forward from here? Thank you for uh, having me, and it's a pleasure to, uh, in, to, to interface with all these great jurors. I think this is such a great time for Minja. If, if you look uh, outside uh, globally, uh, so many forces in the world are creating tailwinds for this country. The world uh, that had been building for a, a truly global, seamless uh, economy is uh, now uh, deglobalizing to some degree, Shireen. We have to build uh, different kinds of supply chains. We have to think about uh, which countries are allied. And uh, that creates opportunities for India as the world continues to uh, decarbonize and try to build a transition towards greener energy. That creates opportunities for India. And as the world continues to go down the path of digital transformation with a current next wave of capability that creates opportunities for India. And I've watched just in the last week that I've been here that the Indian business community as well as uh, the government is enabling um, capture for all of these opportunities to create both uh, opportunities for inside India resurgence, um, but as well as uh, the helping India play a place in this uh, world that's much more meaningful than it's been. So it's, it's a really exciting time. An exciting time for global investors who are looking at India. And you pointed out some of the key themes that are working in favor of India. Deglobalization or reglobalization, decarbonization. Of course, you didn't add demographics, but I'll add demographics to the, to the table uh, as well. But, uh, you know, what is the big risk that global leaders are concerned about? And that doesn't mean India specifically. Uh, but, you know, you talked about allies and wanting to do business with your allies and the geopolitical factors that are now coming into force and coming into play when economic decisions or commercial decisions are being made. How much is that weighing on what's happening within the boardroom today? It's a different world, candidly, in terms of how uh, uh, company boards are making decisions both outside and inside here because of what's happened in the last five years that we've all lived through not just the global pandemic that appended uh, how we work, how we live, but, uh, but global conflicts. Uh, you know, we didn't predict two years ago that Russia would invade Ukraine and that this war would still not be resolved. We didn't necessarily predict that, uh, you know, the, uh, the alignment of uh, certain countries, especially the U.S. and China, for many years would uh, come under tension. Uh, not that long ago, we were expecting a path in the Middle East, uh, perhaps to peace, with the KSA and Israel even normalizing relations. And a month later, it's very different. So all of these are potentially, uh, uh, as you said, global risks that change how companies uh, make their decisions. But frankly, many of those might actually uh, play if India handles itself right, both the government and the businesses, um, to, to create opportunity. And so it's, it's weird to say that participating in India more as a global company might actually be a risk management strategy. Mm -hmm. 
might be a risk management strategy. That's another way of looking at navigating through the kind of turbulence that the world is faced with today. But Zareen, let's talk about the road ahead. And one of the big uh, factors that people are talking about is what has happened as far as the bond inclusion is concerned. Uh, JP Morgan Emerging Bond Index, where Indian bonds now included. Uh, the estimate uh, from JP Morgan is that it could potentially unleash another $25 billion. How do you read these factors? How do you read these developments? And what does it mean now for the short and the medium term as well as for the long term? Yeah, I think it's a very positive development. Um, we see more than 1,000 FPIs registering incrementally uh, with this bond inclusion. And this is just an initial estimate. It can even go higher. And uh, 20 to 25 billion is our house estimate. Uh, if other indexes include uh, India again, that flow could be even larger. You foresee that happening? Do you think yes. that this is only the start? Yes, yes, it's, a, it's the start. And uh, uh, we have to see how this plays out on the forex and interest rates. So we saw uh, two times where we saw very large flows in FI15 and FI18. In FI15, we saw FPIs putting more than $20 billion, out of which $10 billion went to GSEX. And that time, interest rates actually dropped by 60 to 100 basis points at that period. Uh, in FI18, again, we saw about $10 billion coming for GSEX. But that time, that period, we didn't see the moment because that was a period where interest rates were going up. But it does have a, a large effect. And whatever flows are going to come, it's expected it will be 10% of government borrowings for that year. So it will really, really have a very positive impact, I would say. So outside of the inclusion into the global bond indices, which you believe is a big transformative change that, uh, uh, that we could be seeing, uh, what would you put down as the number one growth accelerant outside of this? I would say um, FDI. Uh, if we look at China uh, in the high days, it used to get 4% of the GDP as FDI. If you look at India, it's 1.5% or thereabouts. So clearly that can really supplement the domestic capital. And if you look at sovereign wealth funds and the kind of pools of capital that they have, if you get a larger share of that also coming into the country, to my mind, that can really supplement. We have a good momentum. Mm. But if you want to increase from 65 to say 8%, you need foreign pools of capital, equity capital, supplementing. You know, since we are talking about capital, let me get the other banker on the panel into the conversation as well. Shram Srinivasan, growth accelerants to your mind. Uh, how do you build on the momentum that we've managed to sort of gain at this point in time? What are the priorities that you would like to focus on? Thanks. I think uh, to add on to what Zareen said, uh, since you asked the accelerants, uh, it's really the confluence of technology, uh, the expansion of Tier 2, Tier 3 India, and consumption, right? Even the uh, nominees which we reviewed today, the whole story is an India play. And consumption, I was just reading a statistics, I don't know how true it is. A television is sold every 60 seconds in India, maybe on her, one, one of their platforms. <laughs> if that is what is happening, and all of, large part of it is 4K. A large part of it is coming from tier two, tier three India. Now this is uh, by itself a story. So if the FDI money comes in, supplemented by the domestic consumption and the acceleration that's happening in the economy. Uh, banks, I mean, companies like his or this or mine will just flourish like you know, nobody's business. So we're in a good place. We're in a good place. Let's address the consumption story. And uh, I'm going to get Rohit, uh, Anish, and Nikhil to comment on that. Uh, Rohit, let me start by talking to you. You know, as far as volume growth is concerned, that has been a challenge for FMCG companies. Uh, the rural growth hasn't picked up as much as was anticipated. We're hoping that that will now start to change. How do you look at the consumption story that everyone seems to be betting on, not just in the near term, but more from a medium to a long-term perspective, if this bet on doubling per capita, et cetera, has to play itself out. So I think, like you rightly said, it, we have to uh, see it from a, a bit of a wider arc because we look at the per capita consumption of across all categories that we play in a large swath of categories, we're very, very diversified, uh, are still, you know, uh, one-sixth of neighboring countries. And so there's a huge amounts of opportunity uh, in uh, growing consumption, and we can see that happening at different uh, tiers of the market. So I think the... The many forces such as uh, digitization, the access to information, the access to aspiration, mm. drive uh, you know, this, the, the consuming class wanting to upgrade, uh, 
uh, all of that hunger uh, to have a better quality of life, all of that is in uh, scale in India. Uh, it is going to be and is the, the best consumer story of this decade. And we've just started it, uh, seeing it play out. We've seen, if you look back five years, the middle class and above has doubled. Mm. And we expect that to double again. Uh, and that itself, you know, they, they consume uh, at a much higher factor of uh, consumption, one or two times. So, and we, we will see a huge amount of uh, breakthrough in consumption. Uh, so we, can, uh, we, need, we cannot really focus on a few quarters of mm. inflation, deflation, because that's really a small sliver in the mm. larger arc of the, uh, of the country's uh, trajectory. So we are very, very, as Hindustan Unilever, we very optimistic. We've been here 90 years. Uh, so we see, we've seen this, uh, you know, our business and our country go from strength to strength. And I think the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. And you do believe that this is going to be the Indian consumption decade? Yes, I, I do believe that. And I have some experience of seeing other markets in the last 10, 20 years uh, who have been through, uh, who have gone from, you know, a few thousand dollars per capita to middle income and so on and so forth. I think uh, I can already see those uh, trends. Uh, in fact, uh, some are even faster because what's happened on digital democratiz democratization is amazing because today with mobile phones, vernacular, everybody, uh, nearly a billion people have access to the same information, mm -hmm. the same aspiration. They can uh, buy things on the same platforms. They can consume media. So I think the, uh, and the hard infrastructure is getting better. So I think we might even see a much faster trajectory going forwards uh, because uh, the, the stage is set. The stage is set and, and a lot of these uh, missing pieces have fallen into place. Anish, you know, one of the other trends, uh, uh, just to pick up from what we heard there from Rohit, in terms of the strength of the Indian consumption story, is this move towards premiumization. And we've seen that playing out across different categories. If you were to bet on the trends that you're seeing today, but more importantly, what you believe is going to be unleashed in the future, what are those bets that you would like to make? So we are clearly seeing premiumization, but India is much more than con the consumption story. India is taking leadership in the world today. And the key areas we are seeing that is one with regard to combating climate change. That's creating a host of opportunities in India. The solar challenge or the renewables challenge that's been put out by the Prime Minister is one that is enabling us to grow our solar business multifold. And you're going to see that across multiple industries that will contribute to renewables. The second is around make in India. Mm. Uh, today, Indian companies are making world-class products and are beating global leaders in India. And the next step for us is to beat global leaders around the world. So that's another big step but, forward. But, but, but let, let's address this issue about making in India for the world and taking Indian brands global. Because if you were to take a look at the global pecking order in terms of Indian brands growing global, it doesn't look very good. So how do you make that transition? What will drive that transition to actually be able to get to the global pecking order in terms of aspirational brands as well, not just making India as a contract manufacturer? So it is starting to happen. Mahindra Tractors today is number one globally in terms of volume. And in multiple markets around the world, is starting to gain significant share and starting to get into the top five and top three. Uh, as we're looking at automobiles, our SUVs today uh, are now being taken to a few key markets globally. And we aim to get to a 15 to 20 percent market share in those markets, which is not insignificant. And then beyond that, we'll go to other markets around the world as well. So. That process has started already. It's not that something else needs to happen. I think we've got multiple Indian companies, not just Mahindra, yeah. making products today that can stand up to anyone in the world and be able to go there. So to me, that is a very significant change from what we've seen in the past. Okay, significant change. And in terms of the export ambition, export aspiration, you believe that there's a lot of appetite and a hunger to do a lot more. And we will start to see that happen more and more for different companies across different categories. We are clearly going to see that. And the third area I would look at is technology, because we've been in the back office of the world for a long time. But uh, as we look at startups, and we've got some of our startup leaders here, uh, as we look at IT services firms, as we look at the India stack that's been put in play, India's starting to take world leadership in technology.